chosen to be with us today. We're picking that back up in our last sermon in this series, Fully Engaged. I wish I'd have entitled this now, looking back on it, Four September Lessons on Spiritual Commitment, because that's really more along the lines of what it is. But we kicked off this series and we looked at how you can be fully engaged in our walk with God. And then we looked at how we can be fully engaged with uh, my church. And last week we looked at how we can be fully engaged in my community. And we claim the fellowship valley right and uh, and so and uh, fully engaged means having god as the primary source of strength in my life and, and today we're going to look at being fully engaged with my friends okay so that's what we're going to talk about today and uh, being fully engaged just means being totally committed to something doesn't it being totally plugged in you're not fully engaged then uh, then you're not getting the power out of, out, out of whatever it is that you're involved in. You're not getting the uh, outcome that maybe you could be getting. And so uh, being fully engaged with God means having God as our primary source of strength in, in our lives. And so, you see, the Bible tells us that God is looking all around the world for people who are fully engaged, fully reliant on Him for His strength. So let's go ahead and look at our, our uh, verse for this series that we've been looking at. And let's, let's read this together. 2 Chronicles 16.9 uh, God's Word says this. Say it with me. Let's read it enthusiastically. Y'all know what that means? All right, here we go. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully engaged with Him. Fully engaged. Fully committed. And you know, one of the ways that God blesses lives and strengthens the lives of those who are fully committed to Him is through our friendships and uh, through relationships and, and the those those friendships those relationships you know it's important for us to have godly relationships people relationships with godly people we need to have those in our lives and so that's what we're going to talk about today how we can be fully engaged with our friends and so since we're talking about friends today i wanted us to play a little game okay anybody want to play a game hey. yeah all right we're, we're going to play a little game we're going to play name that tune all right Y'all know how to play Name That Tune? Yeah. Some of y'all don't have any idea what I'm talking about, but if you're, if you're over over 30, probably you know how to play Name That Tune. Maybe, maybe. But anyway, we're going to play Name That Tune, and we're going to play a few songs, famous songs about friends, okay? And so we'll give you a little hint on what it's going to be about. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to be talking about that today. So what I want you to do is our media team, they're going to play some short clips of songs. Let's see, and I'm supposed to freeze this, right? Freeze it. There we go. So I'm going to freeze that. And um, so they're going to play some short clips of each song. And uh, what I want you to do is when you recognize the name or the title of the song and the artist, stand. Okay? And it's the first person that stands up, if you recognize it, uh, you know what? Same me after church. I got something I'll give you. All right? All you winners. All right? So uh, let's let's see how we do. Let's go with the first one now. All right, everybody got it? Well, if you recognize it, stand up. You'll be recognized. If you get it, then you win. Obviously, if you don't, we're going to keep playing until somebody gets it. So let's go with this first one. Can you do that? Here's the first one. Okay, Carla. Carla? Come on. The, you got the artist and the, and the top? James Taylor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sing it, Carla. I can't sing it. <laughs> okay, keep playing it. Make somebody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've got a friend. You got a friend. Yeah. Got a friend. <laughs> James Taylor. All right, that's good. Good job. Rob was trying to pull in out there too at the last minute. So, all right. No. <laughs> he used to be All right. You got a friend by James Taylor. All right. Let's go on to the second one now. Are right, y'all ready? Number two. Brandy, what we got? I'm trying to hear the artist. It's Lean On Me. Mm-hmm. And... Sample. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Original artist. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember the artist. I'm sorry. Good. Who knows the artist? Anybody? Bill Everybody knows Lean On Me, though. Is it Bill yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. close. Withers. Bill Withers. Oh, she got it. She got it. Bill Withers. Lean On Me. All right. All right, let's go to number three. Y'all doing good. All right, number three. I can't go again. Can I? What is it? Can I go again? 
with him and with one another and so inside of us there's a void it, it, when we're by ourselves there's a void that can only be filled with a, with a relationship with God and a relationship with his people okay and so and, and when, when our relationships with other people when they aren't quite right especially that those relationships we need with godly people his people people who will encourage us and help us become more like who God created us to be then there, there's the emptiness in us and that, you know what that emptiness is called? It's a scientific word. Loneliness. Right? We've all, had, we've all been there, haven't we? Loneliness. You know, and you know, it doesn't matter. You know, it, loneliness affects people. You can be married or single. Uh, you, can, you can have a great job or you can have no job. Um, you know, it hits all of us. And, and, but, you know, loneliness is, is, um, is not the end. It's a symptom. It's just a symptom, and and, and the loneliness is like um, you know if you're driving down your road and uh, the check engine light comes on, on in your car. You ever been driving along and all of a sudden you know the check in, engine light comes on? You know that's a warning, isn't it? And that's the, the check engine light's not the problem, is it? You know it's not the problem. It, it's a, it's an indicator that there is a problem somewhere down deep beneath the hood of your car, usually, right? And so that's what loneliness is like for us in a sense. It's it's not the problem, <laughs> it's a symptom of what is wrong inside somewhere. Okay, and that, that's what we gotta, we got to find out, we got to get checked out. And so, I want to ask you this morning, maybe, you know, you, you need to ask yourself this question, is your, is your check engine like that? You know, is, is, is it flashing? Are you dealing with loneliness in your life? Are your relationships not quite what they should be? You know, if they're not, then that's what creates the loneliness. And, you know, you can struggle with loneliness even when you're in big crowds. You know that? I mean, you can be around hundreds or even thousands of people every day, and you can still be affected by loneliness. As a matter of fact, a lot of people who suffer from the loneliness the most are people who live in America's largest cities. Uh, you know, we can be around hundreds and thousands of people every day and not have genuine, real relationships with those people. You know, if I go to Walmart in Sweetwater or Athens or Madisonville, I can't go in there without seeing somebody I know. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yep. But I can go to Walmart in Knoxville or somewhere else, and I can go all through the store. <coughs> and, you know, sometimes I see people I know. But I can go through and, you know, and I can run across hundreds of people sometimes in there and not ever say a word to anybody. Now, usually I do. You know, I just, I just do. But, and, you know, and, and, but I could, if I wanted to, I could go through there, and I could not even make eye contact with them. You know, go through, check out get my car, never say a word, never acknowledge anybody. And some people are like that, you know. And, and, and you know, think for a I minute, mean, just think about all the places you go where you're surrounded by people 
but really you live in isolation to those people. And we live like that a lot of times. And you know, in fact, many of us, you know, we live around people we call our neighbors. Many of us don't really know them. We don't know our neighbors. We don't know where they work. We don't know where they're from. Uh, we don't even know what their names are. We live in isolation to them, really. Don't we? And you know, when we moved away from home, you know, different. In 1996, we left and and, and uh, left Sweetwater, and we moved away. We had to learn how to depend on people who weren't family. You know, when you always live around family, you always got family that you can depend on. But some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You live, move away. When we moved back to Sweetwater last year, it's the first time we ever moved anywhere where we already knew most of our neighbors. You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, but, you know, most of the time we moved in, we didn't know anybody. And, and, and so you have to learn to, to develop relationships and friendships with people that you can trust because sooner or later, no matter where you go, you're going to need somebody. You're going to need somebody. And, you know, and that's who we want to be as a fellowship. We want to be those people that everybody knows if they need somebody, they can call us. That's who we want to be for people, right? Because we're, we're children of, of, of the, the, the king. You know, we, we've got all resources at our disposal to help. And so look with me for a minute at Proverbs 27.10. You got that one ready? There we go. Proverbs 27.10. This proverb says, Never abandon a friend, either yours or your father's. Then in your time of need, you won't have to ask your relatives for assistance. <laughs> Look what it says in the last line. He says, It's better to go to a neighbor than to a relative who lives far away. General wise advice. You know, and and and, and that's good advice. Isn't it? You know, it, it's better to go to a neighbor than to a relative. In some translations say it's better to go to a neighbor than to a brother who lives far away. You know, but it's that general idea of a relative. So, in other words, you know, we need a support network of friends, don't we? We we need that, and and uh, people who can help us grow in our faith, people who are encouragers, and that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at five actions to fully engage a friend. So, when you leave today. You take these five actions, you can become fully engaged with your friends, okay? So mark these down. We're going to give you a lot of good information this morning. Number one, the first action you need to take is you need to write this down. Tell yourself to do this. Put myself in a position to meet people. Put myself in a position to meet people. You see, no matter what stage of life you're in, whether you're single or whether you're married, whether you're in your 20s or your 40s or your teens or your 50s or whatever, whether you're a successful business person, you know, a, a student, you know, it's important to put yourself in a position where you meet people. And, and you need to put yourself in a position where you meet godly people, where you can bring godly people into your life. And uh, that's why we really encourage the Connect Fellowships at the Fellowship Church. And the Connect Fellowships, you know, right now we've really only got one that's kind of meeting consistently and not many of you are coming to that. And that's the one that's meeting on Wednesday nights at our house. Of course, the youth they meet, and that's, that's a Connect Fellowship for our teenagers. And so, uh, you know, these are small groups, and, and it's a place where you can really connect with people on a more intimate level. And, you know, you can get to know them. You can develop relationships. And look, if you're a person who struggles with loneliness, this is something you really got to become a part of. Uh, because, you know, that, that's exactly what you need. That's the cure, and this is what God's called us to do. The reason is, you know, one of the reasons we suffer from loneliness is because we, this is how we often do things. And y'all know what I'm talking about. And you can shake your head when you realize that, yes, you know what I'm talking about. And that is, oftentimes we find four or five friends and we say, you know, we get these friends, we got good relationships with them, and we say, hey, us four and no more. You know, and we won't let anybody else in. We've got our friends and, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm, you're not having to deal with loneliness. It's us four mo no more and we'll make it through regardless, right? But what happens is you get in your comfort zone. You stop being stressed out. You start stop be putting stop putting yourself in a position to meet new people, bring new people into your life to influence you and to help you grow, and and for you to help them grow. And that becomes difficult, but uh, you know when it, it becomes even more difficult when friends we depend on for so long they move away, and all of a sudden we realize we don't have that network anymore. You know, in in, in our lives, and and that's one of the reasons we do these connect fellowships so that we can build that network and and look. You're not committed to continue with the same group indefinitely when we do these Connect Fellowships. You know, my goal is for us when we have these fellowships, for each one, you know, to, to systematically give birth to smaller fellowships that will give birth to smaller Connect Fellowships. And, 
And you know, we go on and we continue to multiply that way and always always meeting new people, always making new new groups and, and always um, uh, growing that way. And you know, it's really not a huge commitment, really, when you think about it. You know, an hour or so, maybe two, uh, once a week, when you consider the rewards, you know, growing in your faith and making new friends. Hey. What, what else you want, you know? I mean, that's what we need. And so it's really not a huge commitment. Now, and listen, here, it's a little harder to make close friends if you just see them on Sunday morning. You know, I mean, I mean that, that's really, it really is. You know, when you think about it, and, and that's what a lot of people want when they go to church. They just want to, they want to slip in the door right about the time worship starts and then slip out right after it's over and go home and they punch their worship card for that week and you know and that's how that's how they live their lives but you know that's not what God's called us to is it God's called us to live in community with one another and so it's a lot a little harder to make those real close friends if you just see them on Sunday morning you know it's a little easier if you come earlier for coffee and donuts and you know we even try to make it easier on y'all by moving our worship time to 11:30 so you can sleep a little later you know and, and, but but if you come in just before worship, get your donut, and then you know, and get right out, then you know you'll realize you never do really meet anybody. You don't ever develop any deep meaningful relationships, and what you have to do is you still have to deal with loneliness. You know, and that's what happens. And and so that's why we try to encourage these groups outside of Sunday morning. And that's why we have a fellowship meal every month on the first Sunday after church. So guess what next Sunday is. Next Sunday morning, we'll have our communion service here after our, after our worship service. And then we'll go to our our place, and we will have a meal, and we can talk, and, and we can gripe if you want to, and we can pray. <laughs> and, you know, we can talk about things about the church, and, you know, we can play cornhole or football or basketball or watch football or, or whatever. You know, we just, it, 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 it's, it's building relationships. It's being friends. It's being family is what it really is. And so... And that's why we encourage that. And, and when we do those things, you can meet people and develop deep, meaningful, real relationships with your brothers and sisters in Jesus. And I think that's one of the things that, that we've got these other churches out here that have been around for a long time. That's one area where we're beating them to death because, folks, we got a, we got unity here. we got a spirit here that you won't find anywhere else. And that's because we love one another. We're, we're best friends. We're family, you know, and, and we're developing that. And that's the way it ought to be. And I... And so one of the reasons we do that, we encourage that because that's what the early church was doing. When you look at the first church in the first century in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, look what they did. They worshiped together at the temple every day. And we only, we only worship here once a week mainly, don't we? But they came, and they, this is not really the temple, but it's kind of a semblance of our meeting place. Every day, and then they met in their homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared meals with great joy and generosity. And you know that means when you're when you are making a meal, you you, you know you do it because you want to, and you and you want to have fun. You don't do it because you have to, right? And they were really enjoying each one, one another. And then all the while they were enjoying one another, and all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. So isn't that awesome? <laughs> You know, you look at what was going on here. You know, if, if the only time you spend around your Christian brothers and sisters is on Sunday morning, I'm going to tell you something. You ain't doing it right. You know? I mean, just look. Th th this is what Scripture says. They, they gathered on the Lord's Day and then through the week, and they loved one another, and they grew, they helped one another grow as individuals in their faith, and they grew as a group, adding, d uh, well, I don't say daily here, but that we know in one part that they were adding daily. People were becoming a part of them. And so don't miss the opportunity to connect with others and grow in your faith. So, you know, that's the first action. Being fully engaged with my friends is to put yourself in a position of being with people. You know, when we've moved around a good bit since I've been a pastor, and, you know, when we've moved, there's been a, a few times, especially in our kids, that said, you know, I just keep, keep having trouble making new friends. And I always tell them this. I say, look, and this is one area where I had a little trouble because, I'm, I'm, I believe it or not, I'm naturally an introverted person, and mm -hmm. and and God has tried to bring me out of that, and you know, and I have to really work on it, and and uh, you know, He's He's changed me a lot because I, you know He's made me where I really love people. But but look, if you want to have a friend, first thing you got to do is be a friend. Mm -hmm. You got to be a friend. Don't wait on others to befriend you. You befriend them. If you start treating them like they're your friend, then they'll start treating you like you're their friend. You know, if, if, you know they will. If you love them, they can't help but love you most of the time, okay? 
It's not always true. I'll, I'll, I'll admit. But but you know, you got to to make a friend. You got to be a friend. And so put yourself in a position to meet people. That's the first action. The sex, second action is this: provide encouragement. You got to do this. Second action: put yourself in a position to meet new people and provide encouragement. Make a friend by providing encouragement to them. Uh, you know, there's really two types of people in the world, right? There's those who add value to your life and make you feel better about yourself. Those that motivate you, challenge you to become a better person and who you are. And then there are those people who just suck a life out of you. You know what I'm talking about? You know, and you see them coming and you just, you just dread it. You're like, oh my goodness. You know, because you know whatever they're going to say or whatever they're going to do, it ain't going to be good. And, you know, and, and, and you may be in a good mood and you see them coming and you just start wilting. You know, I mean, and so every time around you just, you know, you feel worse about yourself and worse about your situation. And so what I'm talking about is there are, there are encouragers and there are discouragers. And you can't do a whole lot about these other people, but you know who you can do something about? Do something about you. You can do something about you. And that's what I want you to focus on is I want to ask you this, which one are you? Which one are you? Are, are you an encourager? Are you a discourager? When people see you coming, they get energized, they glad to see you, or they, they start going, oh my goodness, <laughs> here he comes, or here she comes, you know. Uh, you know and, and, so, and some of us are both. It depends on the situation. It depends on who we're around. I realize that, okay? Uh, but, but look, here's what we're talking about. We need to be encouragers. We need to be encouragers. We've got good news. <laughs> you know? We, we, we can help people because we've been helped by Jesus. And so we need to be those people that when, when they see us coming, they know, hey, here comes good news. Here comes help. That's encouraging. You know, and, and so when you look at the New Testament, the New Testament points out an example of a guy named Joseph who was given a nickname. nickname in Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, and he was nicknamed Barnabas, which Barnabas literally means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. He was a great encourager. That's a great nickname. When you get nicknamed something like that, when you get named Stinky Pants or something like that, you know, that's not a good one. But, but when you get nicknamed Son of Encouragement, that's a good nickname, isn't it? And, and so and that's what we want to go for. The Bible says that, that Barnabas had a piece of land that he sold. He brought the money to the church and he gave it to the apostles and he told them to use it to help the needy and to do whatever the church needed to do with it. And then when Paul went on his first missionary journey, uh, Barnabas had been such an encouragement to him that Paul wanted him to go with him again. You know, Paul, Paul loved having Barnabas around because Barnabas was an encourager. And we all need those people in our life. And I need about two or three of them. I mean, I'm just telling you all the time. And it, but he, you know, he wants us to be sons and daughters of encouragement to the people in our lives. He doesn't want us to be discouragers. He wants us to be encouragers, doesn't he? And um, I got encouraged last week because, you know, we've been trying to raise this money for our church and I spent time out there in that lot praying that God would raise up some money for us to have a down payment. And, you know, and I knew what we needed. It seemed like insurmountable. And I prayed. And this past week, we got $4,500 for a down payment on our bill. Praise the Lord. Okay. Not gifts. And, and we know God's going to provide some more, right? And, and, you know, that's just the start. You know what God could do? God could provide everything we need to buy it right out. Amen. He could do that. And so we, we need to pray and expect, don't we? And, and so it's encouraging when people see you do the right thing. It's encouraging to me when I see you guys stepping out in faith and courage and, and living and loving like Jesus. That encourages me. It, give, it gives me another step, you know? And so that's what we need to do one another. So how are we going to encourage? I want us to look. I think there's uh, there's three, uh, three, three ways. Yeah, be an encourager in three ways. So if you want to be an encourager, there's three ways you can do it. Number one, you can be an encourager through your words. So you say that. Say, teach yourself to be an encourager through my words. The number one way that we can affect people is the way we talk to them. You know, we can either build them up or we can tear them down, you know, and... And we have to decide how we're going to use our words. And, and so, uh, you know, we need to be slow to speak, don't we? One of my <coughs> biggest problems, and, you know, I wouldn't say used to be, but still is a lot of times, I'm just too swift to speak, you know. Uh, Christy's got a little, uh, little uh, pla placard thing that used to be on the desk. I think it's on my bookshelf now. It says, be sure your brain is engaged, engaged before putting your mouth into gear, okay? And uh, we get, get that problem sometimes that we start talking before we start thinking. And... and 
And so, but, but what effect do most words have on people in your life? Do they build people up or do they tear people down? And, and Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, He said, I'll tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day of every idle word you speak. Do you know that? Every word you speak, He knows about. That's a good reason to pay attention about what you're going to say before you say it. Either. And so, He says you'll either be justified in them or you will be condemned in them. And so, Jesus knows that words are important and what we speak, you know, it comes from our heart. And, and so, and so we've got to get our heart right with Jesus if we're going to speak good words of encouragement, don't we? So, because whatever is on the inside, eventually it's going to come out. It, and so, you know, a lot of times we say, we say something and we say, oh, I didn't really mean that. I'm, I'm not like that. But hey, you know, if it's coming out of you, there's a reason, okay? So let's just go ahead and admit it. Let's let God have that. Let, us, let Him clean up our language and our thoughts. And let's be encouragers through our words, okay? The second way we can be an encourager is through acts of kindness. Acts of kindness, that's just a great way to encourage someone, isn't it? You know, sometimes it can be something as simple as just giving them a card, you know, or an invitation to a dinner or, you know, buying them a cup of coffee. You know, random, well, I've talked about random acts, of, act, random acts of kindness a few different times now, but, you know, just serving somebody in some unexpected way, that carries a lot of weight, doesn't it? That says a lot. That says you love them, you know? And it's an act of... And so I want you to think about what's some act of kindness this week that I could show to someone uh, maybe that needs Jesus, you know, or someone that's lonely, you know? Some, uh, somebody that needs a friend. So, so there's another one. Acts of kindness. And number three, you, you can be an encourager to your words through acts of kindness or sometimes just listening, you know? Uh, sometimes people just need somebody to talk to. And, you know, I... They just want to. They want to get it out there, and they just want you to listen. And 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 a lot of times, if you just listen, they'll work it all out while they're talking. You know, you don't ever have to say anything. And then I say, "Thank you so much." You know, I'm like, "Oh yeah, yeah. you're welcome." Yeah, yeah. But but they figured out because it's them and they're struggling. You know, and they're talking to God and God's working. And and you don't ever have to say anything. A lot of times, you just listen, and and, and that's all they need. And so. Do you take time to listen to people in your life? I'll tell you, it's hard sometimes, but if somebody's coming to you and, and they're struggling and they're hurting, uh, listen, and they're lonely, take time to listen to them. Just listen. You know? And, and sometimes that's all they need. And so, you know, it, it, some people say, well, hey, I can't do those things because you know, that's just not my personality. You know what? But look, it's not okay to be a discourager. You know, it's a sin to be a discourager. We've got to be encouragers. You know, instead of helping your friends, uh, uh, you know, uh, grow, instead of helping them improve and investing in their lives, you know, you're tearing them down and making them feel worse if you're discouraging them. So we've got to encourage folks, okay? And so look at our next verse. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.11. It says this, So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you're already doing. And you know, I say a lot of encouragement here. You guys really encourage me. And so just keep on what you're doing. And let's encourage one another. And look around your neighbors and friends and people around you in your life that need that encouragement. And be an encouragement to them. Be a Barnabas. Be, be sons and daughters of encouragement. That's what God wants us to be. So, so number one, we're talking about uh, actions that we can take to be fully engaged, right? Put yourself in a position to meet people. Number two, provide encouragement. And number three, I like this one. Play together. Play together. You know? It'll take you back to your childhood. You know, can Jeremy come out and play? <laughs> and I'm like, hey, a couple weeks ago, and I, I, you know, a couple weeks ago, Jeremy invited me over to his house just to play on Sunday night. I was like, and I, I snuck out. I didn't tell Christy why I was going over there. I was afraid to tell her. You know? but I don't get to do this very often. You know, she might say no. <laughs> but, but just play. You know, play together. And by playing together, I, I, I mean having fun together. You know, we, we, we just played the Xbox. I, didn't, I hadn't played Xbox. I barely knew what Xbox was, but hey. But, you know, but just having fun together. You know, some kind of shared activity. It makes you forget about work. It makes you forget about the problems you're dealing with life. It makes you smile. 
You know, enjoy a fun activity with, with people. You, man, with people you love, you know, and what we're talking about here is being, we're talking about being fully engaged, we're talking about being fully engaged with our friends, I'm thinking specifically about men here, when we're talking about playing together, here really, we think about it because, you know, you know how women mostly connect with one another through the talking, don't they, I mean, they sit down, they talk, they drink their tea or their coffee or whatever, and, and they get this chit chat going on, and they just open up a lot of times their feelings, and, and they have these conversations, you guys don't do not much, you know. I mean, you know, we we just don't do it that way, you know. Uh, how many guys can you picture having a deep conversation about their feelings over the people? You know what I mean? <laughs> guys don't do that, you know. Guys bond through sharing activities together and and doing stuff together, and you know, watching a football game or, you know, I can go to somebody, uh, go to a football game or something with somebody, and I can just sit with them. We can talk about the game, and every now and then, you know, you get a few things in. You talking and. You know, and, and, and you feel like you had a good time, even though you probably didn't, you know, have a page worth of stuff you talked about to write down. I mean, you know, uh, but, but that's just the way it works. But this is just a, a side note for, you know, for you guys in marriages. You know, if you want to connect more with your wives, then communicate more with them verbally because that's what they need, all right? And so women, if you want to connect more with your husbands, then share some fun activity with them because that's how you're going to connect with them, all right? Uh, you know, and it, it's, just, it's just generally the truth, isn't it? It is. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It is. And so, you see, we got to play together. we got to have some fun together. And I think we overlook the importance of having fun together. And that's just something we've tried to do at the fellowship is try to make sure we have fun playing cornhole. And, and, um, and we, you know, there for a while we had our family fun night every third uh, Friday night or something like that and we'd just go rent a gym or we'd do something and we've not been doing it. We, somebody needs to be in charge of our family fun night, our recreation time and, and schedule those things and everybody can't always make it but that's okay because you know what some will. You know what always happens? Somebody will come who doesn't go to church, somebody will come who's lost and they'll develop friendships with other people in the church and eventually you know what happens? They get brought into that circle from the fellowship of the fallen into the fellowship of the family and the fellowship of the Father. And that's where we want them to be. Amen. And so that's what happens. And so we need to do that more. Look with me at Ecclesiastes 8.15. He says, So I, I recommend having fun because there's nothing better for people to do in this world but to eat, drink, and enjoy life. And that way they will experience some happiness along with the hard work God gives them. We all need to do some fun things every now and then. We work hard enough, don't we? We need to do something fun every now and then. Now, some people, all they ever want to do is fun. They don't ever want to work. You know what I'm talking about? But, but you know, we need to have some fun. And so, so um, you know, we need to think about that. And, uh, we, we really need to do this a little more often. And so, play together. Play together. Another action we can take, we're going to try to wrap things up here quickly. And this, this one's not the least important by any means, but we need to pray specifically for our friends. Pray specifically for our friends. If we're going to be fully engaged with our friends, we've got to be praying for them. Pray for your friends. Prayer, you can't be any more personal with anybody than when you pray with them. Pray for them. And so pray on behalf of them. Pray specifically for the things that they're going through. And you... You know, pray for their relationships, pray for their career, pray for their health, pray for financial difficulties, or whatever it is that they're struggling with. And if you do that, you know what happens when you pray for people? Two things will happen. First, you know, uh, the Bible promises that when you pray, uh, God, uh, God's presence and power will come in on that situation, and God will do what He wants to in that, in that one. We're guaranteed that. If you pray for them, God will answer that prayer. He will answer that prayer. And, and we gotta trust that. And God's and not only that, but when we pray, you know what else it does? It not only changes their situation, but it changes us. Because you know what happens when you start praying for people, you you love them more than you did when you weren't praying for them. When you pray for people, you love them. You can love them by praying for them. You know? If you're not praying for somebody, then you're not showing love toward them. You know, we gotta pray for our friends. Um, our love and our affection and our care for that friend is increased when we pray for them. Um, and the Holy Spirit works when we pray for them. The Holy Spirit is at work. He, he loves them and He's making us love them like He does. That's what happens. 
You know? And that's what we want to do, is it? Love them like Jesus. Um, don't do this, though. We're all guilty of this. And, you know, tell somebody, say, oh, yeah, I, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And then, and then don't pray for them because you know what that is? That's a lie. You know, when you tell somebody you're going to pray for them and then you don't. And, and we've all done it. You know, we, we do it. That's one of the reasons now if somebody comes to me and they say, hey, pray for me or pray with me or pray for this person, that's the reason I'll say, if I can, right then, I'll say, okay, let's pray. And we'll pray right then and I'll pray with you and that way I won't forget because guess what? I forget. And and so I always try to pray and I'll guarantee you, if you put a prayer request or somebody puts a prayer request on Facebook and I say, I'm praying right now, that's what I'm doing. I'm praying right then. I won't say I'll just pray for you because if I say that and plan on doing it later, I'll forget most of the time. But I'll pray for you right then. And it may just be a sentence or two, but I want to pray for you. And, and so, you know, pray for people. And, you know, and if you can't pray right then, write it down on something. You know, write it down on a piece of paper or put it in your pocket or carry a notebook or an index cord or index cord, index card, or, you know, I've got an app on my phone, Evernote. That's a great app, Evernote is. And it syncs with everything else you got. And i got a big old prayer list, and that thing just keeps growing. And, you know, and I, and I change. And, I, and, I, and you know, and so it's, it's a, that's where I put all that stuff. And so pray for your friends. Apostle Paul, he prayed, and he prayed constantly. Romans 1, 9, he starts out the letter to Rome, and he says, God knows I pray for you day and night. I bring you and your needs in prayer to God. He prayed for his, his friends. He prayed for people that he loved. And so it's important that we pray for one another. And so even the prayer of God would give you an opportunity to talk. You know, I, I, want you to, I want you to think about people that God would want you to pray for right now. We're, we're thinking about it. We're thinking, thinking about friends. People come into your mind. People that you need to pray for. I want you to write those names down. Start praying for those people, okay? And the last action I want us to look at, let's get, let's get through this is pursue an opportunity to talk about God. Now we've been talking about how to engage our friends. And the first thing you have to do is put yourself in a position to meet new people so that they can come into your life. The second thing you want to do is be an encourager. And you need to have fun activities. You know, you need to play together. And, and then you got to pray for them. But you know what? If you really want to engage people in your life at some point, you got to talk to them about God. you got to talk to them about, about Jesus, okay? And so... Here's the question. Have you thought about where your friends stand with God? What about the people you work with? Where do they stand with God? What about the people in your classroom, you know, across the street? <coughs> you know, where do they stand with God? You know, I know it's kind of weird to talk to family and friends and co-workers and different people about God and faith and about Jesus if you've not done it. I know it is kind of weird, and it can be awkward sometimes. But, but you know what? We should, shouldn't we? You know why? Because there are eternal consequences involved. That's why. You know, a real friend understands the relationship with Jesus is what determines where a person spends eternity. Where they spend eternity with God in heaven or where they spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. That's why it's important. Now, you know, I, I'm not talking about beating somebody over the head with the Bible, okay? You know, and, and you know, being an, 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 an obnoxious um, know-it-all Christian. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm not talking about standing next to your friend and saying, hey, well, you know, it's been a lot hotter this September than normal, you know? You know where else it's hotter than normal? <laughs> Hell! Yeah, that's right. And you know what? If you don't turn your life around, that's where you're going. <laughs> you, know? And, you know, we've all been there. We've, we've had those, we may have had some of those conversations. And, but, you know, that may not be the way you want to do it, okay? Um, and I, I'm not saying, you know, you're standing next to somebody and you say, hey, is that a loose thread on your sweater? <laughs> you know, that, that reminds me uh, that your soul's dangling by a thread over the precipice of hell, all right? And, uh, you know, just thought you might want to know that. <laughs> yeah, you might want to change your act. But, um, but, you know, we're not talking about that. You know, we're talking about praying and looking for natural opportunities because, you know what, God's going to provide those natural opportunities for you to talk about Him your friends. And so you don't have to create them. You just got to be watchful and take those opportunities when God gives them to you. And so pay attention because this is how you get an opportunity to talk to people about God, okay? There's um, a few few things you can do. Number one, be a good friend. That's what we've been talking about. If you want to have an opportunity to talk to your friends about God, be a good friend to them. You know? 
Uh, just be a good friend. Do what we've been talking about. Put your position, yourself in a position where you can know them, play with them, you know, and be an encourager, not a discourager, and pray for them. When you do those things, you're a good friend. Just be a good friend. Because when you're a good friend, you know what happens? They'll listen to you. They'll listen to you if you're a good friend. That's number one. Number two, let your friends know that you're a Christian. Let them know, you know. Don't put on your Lone Ranger mask or, you know, I mean, and hide behind us. There's no Lone Ranger Christians, you know. Let people know who you are in Jesus. You know, um, you know you're know, you not beating them over the head with it like we talked about, but let them know. You know you, hey, it's easy to say, if you're doing your quiet time, it's easy. And, and it's a roll off of you sometimes. If you're doing your quiet time, sometimes you spend time with your friends, just say, hey, you know what I read in the Scripture this morning? Because you'll be thinking about it because you did it. And they'll know you read your Bible. You know what? Reading your Bible every day is a good sign. Well, that's a good sign you're a Christian. Don't mean you are one. But it's a good sign you are, right? And, and so, you know, it's, it's important. Let them know you read your Bible. Let them know you pray. You know, if they're going through a rough time, say, hey, let me pray for you over this. And just say, hey, can I pray with you right now? Pray with them. You know, when I started doing that, you know what I've seen is, is uh, somehow through that, the Holy Spirit is powerful at least, I'm telling you. When you pray with people, God works. He does. And, and so, you know, just pray with them. It's important, you know. And, and let your friends know you're a Christian, you know. And, and just, just let them know by, by the way you live your life. Be a good friend. Let them know you're a Christian. And number, number three, pray for them. And, um, you know, let it be a natural opportunity. Invite them to come to church. And, and the last thing you need to do is just talk about your faith. Talk about some of your struggles. Talk about who you used to be. Talk about who God has made you. Talk about what God's doing through you and the vision God's given you. Talk about your church. Talk about what God's teaching you in your life right now. Talk about your faith. Let them know. If God's at work in your life, you can't help but talk about this stuff. If you're having trouble talking about this stuff, it's because you're not <coughs> as engaged with God as you need to be. Probably. Okay? And, and that's just the truth. And so look at 1 Peter 3, verses 15 through 16. It says, if you're asked about your Christian hope, it says, always be ready, be ready to explain it. See, if you're asked about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it, but you must do this in a gentle and respectful way. Okay, so be ready. Would you be ready today if, if God gave you that opportunity to talk to somebody about Him? And so what I'm going to ask you to do is... Uh, uh, you know, we've been talking about today is I want you to prayerfully consider some friends. And you know, I'm, we do this a lot. And I know you got some. I want to ask you to do ten friends that you can pray for. Okay, think about ten friends that you can pray for that you can invite to church. Consider writing those names down. Ten friends who you don't know that don't go to go to church who you don't know if they have a relationship with God. And start praying for them. Okay, start praying for them. Start being a friend. Start doing this. Engage with your friends. Okay. All of us have got people we know that don't go to go to church, and you know it, it's a good opportunity. So you see, what we've been talking about it means to be fully engaged with your friends, and Jesus is ultimately that example. And he he fully engaged himself with us, didn't he? And so, uh, because Jesus is our friend, laid down his life for us. He died on the cross so that we could have a relationship with God. He sacrificed himself so that we could be friends with God. You know, when we're talking about friends today, and the Bible says. That's the ultimate, ultimate exp expression of friendship, is it? That a man would lay down his life for his friends. And so, look, I, I want I, this is what you need to do today, okay? If, uh, if you've never taken that step and you've never accepted the, the offer of God's friendship today, that's what you need to do first and foremost. And so, uh, I pray today that you'd say this prayer for the first time. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Let, Maybe you just need to pray this prayer. God, I want to be your friend. I want to receive that offer of friendship that Jesus offered on the cross. I want you to come into my life and forgive my sins so that I can have a relationship with you and so that my eternity with you will be secure. And so we look at that verse and you think about that verse. If you pray that verse with your head bowed right now, if you just pray that, then then there's no better decision you can make. You can ask Jesus to come in your life, forgive you of your sins, and, uh, and have that desire to want to spend eternity with Him. If you'll do that today, the Bible says that He'll come in to you. And so right now, God, we pray that you just have your way in every heart and life.
as we finish up uh, uh, right now, God, we pray that you uh, that we'd all leave here, Lord, fully engaged with you, ready, ready, Father, fully to be fully engaged with our church, fully engaged with our community, and fully engaged with our friends. And so, right now, God, have your way, in Jesus. Name. Let's all stand together. God, speak into your heart today. Maybe you want to be a friend of God. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus. We want to encourage you to do that right now. And so, as we begin to sing, you can make your way up here. We'll pray with you. Uh, you can pray right where you are. We can talk to you later. But let's let God be obedient. If you're lonely today,